Yes, hello, Robert Bastian here. The subject is the relationship between RCPD, GERD, SIBO, and IBS. And uh, before we get much further, I need to define terms, so I'm going to take you to a website called Laryngopedia. We're going to go to the search window here, type in RCPD, and up comes a huge post. There are several of them here, but the, the first one is the comprehensive one. I'm going to uh, click on that and just remind you that it's a disorder that's really centered around the inability to burp. Uh, the person may have been able to burp as a baby, but basically they can't remember much of or all of their life being able to burp, other than sometimes some micro burping that's non-relieving. And so they develop socially awkward gurgling noises. You've got some good examples here, audios. And then uh, the bloating can be tremendous, meaning abdominal pressure and even distension. Sometimes chest and neck symptoms are quite terrible as well. And then crazy flatulence. And then there are a lot of lesser, less common, but less universal, but still very common symptoms. So you can look at that as you wish. So why are we uh, asking the question, how, what's the relationship? It's because when people have RCPD, they often have seen other physicians who may have zeroed in on one of that long list of symptoms and made it the whole problem. And so they come up with a diagnosis of GERD and SIBO. And so the question is, well, how do those diagnoses relate? Well, typically they are the result, in my opinion, of the, uh, of the RCPD, not other things like lactose and, and uh, gluten intolerance. Those are separate diagnoses that could coexist, but most diagnoses that patients arrive with are the result of the RCPD. They haven't diagnosed the RCPD, but they've zeroed in on a sub-symptom. So uh, how does the RCPD cause all of these different things? Well, let me take you back to Laryngopedia, and I've just gone down the, the page, and I found this photo essays from our RCPD patients, and these kind of explain. If you look at that picture, for example, this is a huge distension of the stomach with air. Well, imagine the back pressure on the sphincter muscle that goes into the esophagus. Well, constant high pressure against the sphincter muscle is going to cause that sphincter muscle to weaken and fail, and so the person is uh, logically going to get GERD. So GERD isn't the primary diagnosis, it's a, it's a result uh, of the RCPD, and of course when we treat the RCTB, RCPD, sometimes the GERD, the heartburn gets a little worse for the first week or two, but then long term it's often much improved because you've taken away the, the cause of the RCPD. So that is often uh, where the, the relationship there is often causal, RCPD being the big issue and GERD being the result, uh, one of the many results. Well, what about SIBO? Uh, that's an interesting one. Actually, let's do irritable bowel next, IBS. Well, that's an interesting one because do you see how there's a lot of air here in the transverse colon? there's a huge amount of air in the descending colon. Well, the colon, when distended like that, it could uh, you know, give you alternating diarrhea and constipation. Uh, if you have all of this air in the colon and your abdominal wall squeezes and your colon wall squeezes in order to, to uh, pass stool, can you see that you're squeezing on air and air is very compressible and so you may develop constipation. So that IBS may in actuality be not true IBS, but the result of this RCPD. So I hope that makes sense to you as well. Well, SIBO is the most interesting one. And I have thought for quite some time that uh, the GI tract, uh, it contains a huge amount of what are called anaerobic uh, bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria prefer uh, to grow in the absence of oxygen. But we have people who are putting through huge amounts of air uh, on a daily basis, and so it stands to reason that that might alter the microbiome. 
and uh, change towards some more aerobic bacteria and and uh, maybe disadvantage some some obligate anaerobic uh, bacteria and uh, you know just sorry to be kind of gross but a lot of our patients with this RCPD will say the air goes through me so fast sometimes that there is no odor and so I've thought to myself well maybe there's no odor because it just didn't, it went through so fast that it didn't have a chance to pick up any odor but that doesn't really make sense and it makes me wonder instead if the bacterial composition of the GI tract is changed so much that the odors that are normally formed in the GI tract are not formed because the bacteria that create that hydrogen sulfide and methane and all of the gases that we produce um, ha have been altered and th those gases are, are either diminished or, or absent. So anyway, so why do I go through this uh, discussion? It's because again, well I had someone very recently and actually, I had uh, diagnosed her almost three years ago with RCPD, but she, based in her personality and based in some of the physicians she's seen, she has spent a great deal of time uh, pursuing these SIBO and GERD and all kinds of things, tons of testing and everything, and I think her her many visits to doctors, kind of not wanting to, to accept the diagnosis of RCPD, her many visits and her many tests have sort of exhausted her and finally brought her back around and now she's going to do the, the simple, straightforward treatment for RCPD in a few weeks. And I think if I'm right based on uh, my personal caseload of almost a thousand patients, I suspect that all of those other symptoms that she's been pursuing with doctors and testing will just vanish. Um, I think she's a person who it just was too simple for her that all of her, her diverse and major GI symptoms could be the result of her, her inability to burp. I think it just she just needed it to be more complicated than that. So anyway, that's why I've made this video in case you're a person who's been, you know, searching for answers to individual symptoms rather than understanding that the whole bunch of them can't burp, gurgling, bloating, flatulence, nausea after eating, painful hiccups, hypersalivation, mechanical shortness of breath, inability to fill fully because you're so full of air, and even constipation, all of those things, they're not necessarily present in every patient, but some mixture of those sort of 10 symptoms uh, define RCBD, and it's a prima facie diagnosis. It's a diagnosis that's made based on match to that uh, sort of symptom complex. Uh, I, I don't think you need to do tests for all of the, when it's been years and years and years. Uh, if, if you developed that, this whole syndrome recently, then of course I would do some testing. Well anyway, it's just, I'm just trying to save you from spinning wheels, expense, the discomfort of a lot of testing, and so just presenting this for your consideration. Thank you for listening.